and we'll go ahead and let Robert um, tell us all about how to wake up our bikes for spring. Thanks, Robert. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to thank the Dunlap Public Library and the Peoria Public Library for hosting me today. And we are going to go ahead and get started with waking up your bike for spring. There's a um, toolkit that I'm going to mention um, in the presentation, and that's available. Um, I checked it out from the Dunlap Public Library, which is my home library. It's available at all the libraries along the Rock Island Trail, and a, a lot of other libraries who are not along the Rock, Rock Island Trail have similar things available. So check with your local library. Now the first step is to take your bike down from the safe place it has been stored all winter long, or dig it out of the basement or wherever it got thrown last winter. Now let's take this bike. Take a look at it and tell me if you can see what's wrong with this bike. Well, there's no reflectors on it. That's a big problem. And there's lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. Lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. All of this needs to be cleaned up and lubricated. Also, the tires are very badly dry rotted. You can see the cracks there. And in this next photo, as I push down, you can see that these tires are just very, very badly dry rotted and cracked. There's every possibility that if these tires were inflated to their proper pressure, they could start to come apart. So these tires definitely need to be replaced. So first step, this is a coaster brake bike. Um, basic, I'm sure all of us, either as a kid or as an adult, have ridden a coaster brake bike. That's where you turn the cranks backwards to um, slow the bike down or stop it. So the first step, take this coaster brake arm apart. And then I'm taking the rear axle nuts off here. And it's very important whenever you're working on a bicycle or pretty much any mechanical device to use the proper size tool for the job. You can see here this nut was rounded over most likely when someone used an adjustable wrench or an ill-fitting, you know, the wrong size wrench. So you need to be very careful when working on, on bicycles to use the right size wrench. Make sure there's no slop. If, if you have to use an adjustable wrench, um, make sure that it fits very tightly on the fastener each and every time you, you make a turn on that fastener. Now, if you need to take the chain off, the first step is to find the master link and determine what type of master link, because there are many, many different varieties of master link. Some have a simple little snap ring that you can pry apart with a screwdriver and the chain comes right apart. Um, most chains these days, you need a press, or you can use a punch and a hammer um, to remove one of the links, but you want to find the one link that's a little bit different than all the rest of the links. Um, or sometimes if you'll, you'll look at your chain and all the, the links, every single one of them looks exactly the same. And that's okay too. You're, you're just going to have to pick a link pretty much at random, and it will come apart pretty much exactly like this chain does. But this, this old bike, it definitely does have one discernibly different link. So that's the master link and that's the one I'm gonna take apart. Now this handy dandy tool is available from my local library. It comes in that little bicycle repair kit and it's used to drive the pins out of the master link. Or like I said before, if you can't find a discernible link, just any link will come apart just like this. You drive one of the pins out and the link comes right apart. Here's a closer view of that master link press. Now it's important when you're working on bicycles to remember that on the left side of the bike, the threads on those pedals and the threads that hold the cranks together are going to be left-handed threads. 
Um, if you've worked on anything mechanical, you've heard the phrase, uh, right is tight and left is loose. Well, that's true almost all the time, unless it's left-handed threads. And then it's exactly the opposite. Left, turning the, the fastener to the left would tighten, um, would tighten it, turning it to the right would loosen it. And this is done because on the left side of the cranks, as you're riding it and applying torque, if they were standard right-handed threads, there's every possibility that those um, could come loose while you're applying torque and pedaling the bicycle. Now, these are the crank bearings on this bicycle. And if you look closely, the grease has just basically solidified and become dirty and sticky. And all of that needs to be cleaned off and um, re-lubricated. Uh, th this older type of bearing, th these seem to last forever. Um, they're, they're great big bearings. So these bearings are going to be just fine as soon as I clean them up and re-lubricate them. Now I'm going to remove the handlebars and the neck. The first step is to loosen this neck bolt. It doesn't need to be loosened a whole lot. It's a very long bolt, only about three eighths of an inch or so. Just get it loose and then need to give it a tap with a hammer to drive that bolt back down. And then the neck is loose. You can see it's dropped down into that fork tube. And this is what I was doing. This is called a stem expander bolt. And basically what this is, there's two wedges that are machined into this. Um, one wedge is machined into the neck. And the other wedge is the actual nut on the end of this stem expander bolt. And as you tighten this, the two wedges come together and expand and grip the inner diameter of your fork tube. Um, with some slight variations, every bicycle I've ever worked on has had some type of stem expander bolt with these wedges that hold the neck in place. And every time you have to tap them down a little bit to, to get them to come loose, you can see if I remove that big long bolt completely, these two wedges would still be wedged together and I still would, would not be able to remove the um, neck assembly. So you need to give it that little tap to knock it loose and then it'll come apart. But these are the headset bearings. They allow the fork to rotate and they were also sticky and gooey and dirty, but the bearings themselves that were in, in fairly decent shape. It's just a matter of cleaning it and re-lubricating it. Now your bike, when you pull it out this spring is probably, hopefully, not going to be in this state of disrepair. This bike actually was abandoned um, at the Dunlap Public Library. And it sat out there for quite a while, at least a year. And then I decided to do this program and rebuild this bike. And um, it, it got delayed and I forgot about it. And it sat outside at my house for another winter. So this bike was very, very neglected um, and left exposed to the weather for quite a long time. So when you pull out your bike, like I said, hopefully it's not going to be in this sad a shape. Um, here's a photo of the front axle bearings on this bike. Once again, there are those cage type bearings. Um, the, the, the front wheel would barely turn. These were so gooey and sticky. So the axle bearings on this bike, which are these cage bearings and very easy to work on and um, very durable, even with this amount of dirt and gook on them. Basically, all that needs to be done is they need to be cleaned up and re-lubricated and reinstalled. The hub on the wheels, that's where the bearings ride inside the wheel. That also needs to be cleaned up, um, get all the dirt and gook off of it polish away any corrosion on those races where the, the, the bearings ride. Now I'm removing those old dry rotted tires. It's very important when you're working on um, tires like this not to use a screwdriver or anything that has a sharp metal edge. 
Um, these plastic tire removal tools, these red ones here came in the kit that I checked out from my library. Um, if you use any kind of metal, you're going to scrape up your wheel. You could quite possibly pinch the inner tube um, and just do damage. Um, if you don't check out the, you know, these from the library, you can buy a set of these. I, I just recently purchased one from Bushwhacker for $3. It's very worth the investment to have a set of these if you're going to be changing any tires on any bicycle. They, they make it a lot easier and you won't be damaging your wheel or your inner tube. Now, if you look at this picture, the wheel in the back has been cleaned up and the wheel in the front has not. The product I use to clean up these wheels is quadruple zero steel wool. It's a fantastic product for doing all kinds of metal polishing. Um, it removes surface rust. Uh, it can take a wheel that looks like this one in the front and make it look pretty much brand new. But if you do this, you need to make extra extra sure that you're using quadruple zero steel wool that's four zeros if you grab a, an sos pad out of your out from under your sink in the kitchen and start doing this you're going to scrape you're going to scratch and scuff up the chrome and it will actually dull the chrome and it, it'll make it corrode faster and it'll look really bad they sell quadruple zero steel wool at pretty much any hardware store, any um, home improvement center. Um, it's very inexpensive and it's a great product to have for, for cleaning and polishing metal. Now here's the bearings and the bearing cups and races all cleaned up and ready to be re-lubricated. You can see I've got a chunk of quadruple zero steel wool right there that I was using to polish those, those races and bearing cups. And now I'm re reinstalling those bearing cups. The, um, the bearing cups are a press fit, but it's not a terribly tight press fit. You don't need an arbor press or anything like that to put them back in. When I remove them, I just took a, a, an old flat bladed screwdriver and popped them out from the reverse side and they came right out. And now I'm, when I'm putting them back in though, I definitely don't want to hit them just straight with that hammer. That's why I'm using these old chunks of wood and I'm setting the, the opposite side on a piece of wood and then using a separate piece of wood to tap in those bearing cups and seat them properly. But you don't wanna hit them directly with a hammer that will ding and dent them and, and damage them. And so just a little chunk of wood makes them go back in, no problem. Now I'm reinstalling the headset bearings, a little bit of grease. This top nut that you see here, that does not need to be cranked down by any means. Basically finger tight until you've got any slop or wobbliness out of that fork, it does not need to be cranked down. If you, if you tighten a nut like that really tight on bearings, you can actually damage the bearings and, and greatly shorten their life. Now here's the crank bearings. For grease on a bicycle, especially like this, you don't need anything special. I just purchased a can of red axle grease at the local hardware store, very inexpensive. Um, you don't need anything special to do this. Plain old red axle grease will work. And I'm reinstalling the cranks. This type of crank is called a one piece crank because it's one piece of metal, it's one cast, that the um, threads have been machined onto. You're gonna see on most modern bikes, they have what is called three-piece cranks, where the cranks where your pedals go are two separate pieces from a center axle that rides in your frame. You need a special puller for removing three-piece cranks. That puller is available in that kit that I checked out from my local library. And now I'm reinstalling new tires and I'm actually using the old inner tubes. Who knows how old these inner tubes were, but they, they were quite old and you saw how poor a condition the tires were in. But believe it or not, the inner tubes inside those tires were just fine. And fortunately, since I was very careful removing them, 
I can reuse them. Um, they, they hold air no problem. Um, still got, I've got the bike right behind me actually, and I checked the pressure this morning and it's still, there's, they hold air no problem. But especially, you know, once again, installing a new tire, you want to use these plastic tools because I can almost guarantee every time if, if you use a screwdriver, you will pinch your tube and destroy it. Um, it. These plastic tools make it so easy to safely install a new tire. And like I said, a set of them is $3 over at Bushwhacker. Very inexpensive, well worth the investment. I thought this was a clever safety feature on this old bicycle. Um, the washers that go around the front axle have a little tab on them that fits into a hole on the front fork. And I'm sure many of us have heard horror stories about somebody's front wheel falling off and the, the front forks digging into the pavement and somebody just eating asphalt. And this little washer, the way it hooks in here, if that front axle nut comes a little bit loose, your front wheel is not going to fall off. This will hold it in place and, you know, you can safely stop the bike and take it home and tighten up those nuts. Now, pointing this out because it would be very possible to install this washer the opposite way and defeat that little safety feature. Whenever you're working on a bicycle, you want to be aware of any safety features it has and make sure that anything you remove is installed properly. Uh, you, you don't want to uh, disable any safety features of your bicycle. Now here I've got the bike all put back together, but what did I forget? I wonder if anyone can see what I forgot to reinstall on this bicycle. I forgot the chain guard. Now here it is actually all put back together. Um, I point out that I forgot to reinstall that chain guard because especially when you tear something apart this much, you might forget something. You might set a piece off to the side in a weird spot and forget to reinstall that. Make sure you keep track of all your parts and make sure everything is reinstalled. Um, now you can look at this bike. It's got reflectors front and back. I, installed those great big reflectors on the wheels. Everything is cleaned up and now this bike is ready to roll. When you do a project like this, or when you take a bike out that hasn't been looked at in a long time, you wanna check every single fastener on that bike. You wanna make sure that everything is tightened up, nothing's loose, nothing's gonna fall off, nothing's gonna give you trouble when you're going down the road. and check your tire pressure. The recommended tire pressure is gonna be embossed on every single tire on the side. Um, the thing is, there's a lot of different pressures and you want to know exactly what that particular tire is calling for. Also, it's, it will say the pressure, you don't have to have it filled up exactly to that pressure. Say the pressure is 50 pounds. Probably 45 pounds is gonna be just fine. The thing is you don't want to go over what it recommends on the side of the tire. There's a couple of tires on that white wall. It's really easy to see that the recommended pressure is 40 PSI. On the gum wall tire, it's a little bit harder to see, but that one is 75 PSI. And there's a tremendous range of pressures that bicycle tires might need to be inflated to. Anything from 30 PSI on a, a, one of those big tire bikes uh, up to 100 PSI. And you want to look at your sidewall, see what the recommended pressure is, and don't go over that recommended pressure. I highly recommend that you buy a good quality bike pump. Using an air compressor on a bicycle, I have seen people blow the tire right off of their bicycle using an air compressor. Um, air compressors put out a tremendous volume of air, 
And especially if you're not using one of those fillers that has a built-in gauge and a, a, a little lever that you push, if it's one that you just press down on the valve stem and it starts to inflate, every chance you could overinflate your tire and, and make it explode or just overinflate it and damage things. Uh, a bicycle pump like this is a great investment um, just if you own a bicycle because checking the tire pressure is something you're going to want to do frequently. This particular bicycle pump I purchased at least 20 years ago, and it has been working fine. Um, the hose cracked last year, and I had to put a new hose on it, but in 20 years, I've had to replace one component of this bicycle pump. Um, definitely well worth the investment. It's got a built-in gauge there, so I'm not going to over-inflate my tires, and it's a very handy thing to have around. These are the tools I would recommend you have if you're gonna be working on your bike. A good quality set of sockets, both metric and standard. Often you find that bicycles will have a combination of metric and standard fasteners on them. You wanna make sure that you have a good quality set of, of metric and standard sockets. Also a set of metric and standard wrenches those box wrenches I have. And there's my trusty ball peen hammer I use to remove the neck. And I've got a, an adjustable in there. Now that's a very high quality SK adjustable wrench. It is very well made. Um, that particular wrench belonged to my dad. It's one of those tools that I have no idea when it was purchased because it has existed my entire life. And it still is one of the best adjustable wrenches I have ever encountered. So that's why I hang on to it. If you're going to use an adjustable wrench, make sure it's a very high quality adjustable wrench. Make sure that that movable jaw does not um, wobble up and down. Um, if it's sloppy or um, out, you know, out of square, get rid of it. It's going to cause you problems. An extra 10 millimeter wrench. Um, this is kind of a running joke with mechanics. Um, your 10 millimeter wrench seems to always go missing. Someone borrows it or you set it down somewhere and it seems to be gone. Also, everything has 10 millimeter fasteners. It seems to be the, the one universal thing that no matter what you're working on, you're going to encounter a 10 millimeter fastener. Um, even Harley Davidson's. I have a friend who's a lifelong Harley Davidson mechanic and he has. 10 millimeter wrenches and sockets in his toolbox because, I, and I believe it's an ignition component that requires a 10 millimeter wrench. Screwdrivers. A nice quality set of flat tip and Phillips head screwdrivers are, are gonna be necessary. Um, different sizes, uh, sometimes some bikes have uh, larger, Phillips head, smaller, you, you, you need to make sure you have the right size and that you're fitting any fastener. Just like with the wrench, you need to make sure that any screwdriver you use actually fits the fastener snugly. On the right-hand side there, I have a quarter-inch socket set. Um, I purchased that set years ago at a hardware store, and it's a handy thing to have because it has an adapter that holds screwdriver bits. It's great for getting into weird little spaces where it's hard to get a regular screwdriver. It's also fantastic for loosening stubborn fasteners that may be corroded or over tight. Standard and metric Allen wrenches. That old green bicycle, it of course had absolutely no Allen um, wrenches, fasteners on it at all. But most modern bicycles that you encounter are going to require Allen wrenches. Um, uh, purchasing a good quality set of standard metric Allens is, is a really good idea. The holders like this to keep them organized and keep you from losing them are a great idea. These particular sets have a ball end on the long end. That's great for getting into weird angles and uh, running a screw in um, from a weird angle. These particular sets 
I, I think I bought them when I was in my 20s. You can see they're, you know, they, they've seen a lot of use, but they're still going strong. Now, this is that toolkit that I mentioned that I checked out from my li library. A lot of specialty tools that you might need for working on a bicycle. And this, as I said, is available at the Dunlap Public Library and all the, all the libraries along that Rock Island Trail. Now, WD-40. WD-40 is a fantastic product for cleaning scratchy pots on old guitars. Um, not kidding. It, it actually works great for that. If you have a, an old guitar and when you turn the volume and tone knobs, it makes that screechy, scratchy noise, WD-40 will you, you soak it down with that. It'll clean it right up. But WD-40 is not a great product for using on your bicycle. You don't want to spray down your chain and your derailleur with WD-40. WD-40 is much better for cleaning than it is for lubricating. Now, these are the products I used on that green bicycle. I use plain old 409 to clean off a lot of the dirt. Um, I use gunk parts degreaser to get that old sticky, nasty grease off of the bearings and the chain. Um, PB Blaster, I think that that is a much better penetrating oil than just about anything on the market. If you have fasteners that are corroded together, soaking them down with PB Blaster is, it's gonna loosen them up if anything will. And for the chain and cables, use a good quality chain and cable loop. Um, the kind I purchased was Liquid Wrench. Picked that up from the, the local auto parts store. Um, but that's what you should be using on your cables and chain. They make specialty products such as chain wax. Um, I've never used that much, and um, I've, I've always had really good luck just using the spray chain and cable loop. And also, I used plain old Carnuba car wax on this bike. Now, like I was saying before, your bike, hopefully, is not going to need nearly as much work as this old green thing did. But what are the minimums that you should be doing before you ride your bike this spring? You need to check for tire and brake wear. Look at your tires. If you see dry rot on those sidewalls, you're gonna to need to replace those tires. Look at your brake pads. Are they worn? If they're showing just minor wear, probably no big deal. But if they're showing significant wear or especially uneven wear, you're gonna to need to look at those brake pads and replace them. And if they're worn unevenly, find out why your brake isn't hitting squarely on the wheel. Check for loose or missing parts. Um, if your bike doesn't have those reflectors on it, put those reflectors on. Um, visibility is highly important on bicycles. If your handlebars are a little bit loose, if anything's a little bit loose, you need to make sure everything is nice and tight. Check for corrosion. Any corrosion you find on your bike needs to be cleaned up and a good coat of wax put on to keep that corrosion at bay. Wheel trueness. Basically, this means when you take that wheel and you spin it, you don't see it wobbling back and forth. If you see the wheel wobbling back and forth, that means it's out of true. It's possible to adjust that out by tightening and loosening the spokes, but it's pretty tricky. I would highly recommend if one of your wheels is out of true, take the wheel off the bike, run it down to the bike shop and have them true it. They can do it very quickly, rather cheaply, and they have a, a truing stand there. They'll make sure that that wheel spins nice and straight for you. And also cleanliness. You just make sure the bike is nice and clean. Clean and wax all painted and chrome parts. You may not think about waxing your bicycle the way you might your car, but plain old car wax, it's going to help protect the paint and the chrome on your bike. It's going to make it look better and make it look better for much, much longer. It's 
quick and easy thing to do and it will really extend the life of your bike and extend the length of time that your bike's just going to look pretty. You need to lubricate the chain and all the cables and of course check your tire pressure and if all those things are good you're good to hit the road. Now here's a bicycle. This is probably a lot more like what you have at home, a much more modern bicycle. Looking at this bike, it's got reflectors on the front and back wheels. There's reflectors on the pedals, reflectors front and back. No dry rod on the tires. It looks like this bike is ready to go. You can just grab it and hit the trails. But wait, that frayed cable on that rear brake, if those frayed ends poke you in the leg, you're going to know it. Um, and also that cable is only going to get worse if something's not done about it. Also, believe it or not, cat hair is not a good chain lubricant. So a few things do need to be done to this bicycle. First of all, just going to wash it. Plain old car washing soap and a scrub brush. Um, even the chain, I, I scrubbed the chain to get all of that cat hair off of it. And where that cable had started to come unraveled, I simply spun the individual wires back together and crimped a new cable on the end. That cable did not need to be replaced, just a new ferrule on the end, and it's good to go. Then I took my degreaser and sprayed down the chain and the derailers lubricated that, check the tire pressure. Now this bike is ready to go. So get out there and have fun. Have all the fun. Visit your local library. But just get out there and enjoy the trails and enjoy the lovely weather and have fun on your bicycle. This last photo is of the repair station at my local library, the Dunlap Public Library. Um, they have a pump and some various tools that you might need to make emergency adjustments on your bicycle while you're out there. And in the background, you can see that Rock Island Trail. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, that link there, the Bike the Trail, that's about the Rock Island Trail. Very neat trail. It's, um, it, it's fun. It's not very challenging. It, there's not a lot of hills or anything you have to go up and down because it was built on a railroad bed. Um, or check out bikepeoria.org. The bike co-op here, um, great guys, a lot of help, and you can get some really cheap parts from those guys. And now I think we're ready for some questions. Okay, I see one question here. Um, please point to all the spots that need lubrication. Well, let me. Show you a few things. The bearings. Um, that I mean, like when you're tearing apart a bike, the way I tore apart this one, the bearings in the headset and the cranks are going to need to be lubricated. In general, what you're going to need to do um, when you just take your bike out of storage, though, is basically lubricating the chain and the derailers. You want to make sure there's no debris or dirt on your chain. And then any points where the cable is, you want to squirt some of that chain and cable lubricant down in the jackets around your chain. I mean, around your cable.
Um, Mike's asking, um, he's, he's concerned about um, having a flat tire in, in a remote area. Um, if, if you're going to be far off the beaten trail, that's not a bad idea. If you have a, a quick release wheel, that's all you would need, um, and a pump. You would need to have one of those little bicycle pumps that you carry with you on your bicycle everywhere. Um, or um, the repair kit, yeah, this wouldn't be in a remote area, but the repair kit, it also has a, um, a tire patching kit in it. Um, but yes, if you're if you're going to be in a very remote area, um, perhaps mountain biking or such, where you're not going to be around any place where you can find an air pump, yes, you might want to get these and one of those pumps that you just attach to the bar of the bike and carry that with you. Any other question. questions? What was that? No, I was just asking also if there were any other questions, Robert. Um, the other question is, can you show an actual removal of a tire um, and, uh, and lube and tube? We actually have about three questions in here. <laughs> um, oh, so somebody's asking for routine cleaning to get off um, dust and dirt. Is it better to use 409 and soap and water? Um, need to be afraid of rust, question mark. Um, the 409 is is great, like especially if you have like old grease. Um, 409 is great for removing very greasy things. Um, I, of, of course, especially you know with either of these bikes, I wasn't concerned about uh, rust because I was going to dry them off right away. Um, uh, bicycles, for the most part, are built to withstand, you know, like if you're out riding in the rain, um, they're, they're going to get wet. Um, some off-road bikes are, are going to get very wet. So for the most part, they're built to withstand getting wet. You don't want to leave your chain especially wet for a great length of time. Um, just taking rags or paper towels and drying it off it is going to help um, prevent that, that rust from occurring. Um, but you know, sorry, you know, there's, there's no like straight answer for it, for that. It depends on what you're trying to clean off. If it's just general dirt, then yeah, just soap and water. Um, like I, I in the picture I showed of, of working on this blue bike, I, I scrubbed the whole thing, um, with soap and water and, um, sprayed it off with the hose. But then I, I took rag towels and dried everything off and then i used um the degreaser to get any residual um lubricant off of the chain and derailleur before i um re-lubricated that got another question of how old should kids be when they learn to fix bikes oh um <laughs> yeah i had a, a photo to illustrate that for me That is a very, very subjective question, um, which makes it hard to answer. Let me, um, see if I can go back into screen share here. This picture here, 
is me when I was 11 years old. And my brother and I had just replaced the neck and front fork on this bicycle um, because we had broke it, you know, out jumping this bicycle. And um, you can see, you know, I, I don't have a helmet on there. Um, I do have some safety pads on the bicycle. So I, I was somewhat concerned about safety. But um, and I, at this point, I had been working on my own bicycles for at least a couple of years. But it all depends on the kid. Are they going to be interested in working on bicycles? Um, do they have the mechanical aptitude? Um, but, you know, a kid could be six years old and, um, and be interested in it. But I, it would be a really good idea to have that kid help work on a bicycle um, rather than just saying, oh, here, Johnny, here's some tools. Go fix your bike. Um, they're they're going to need some adult supervision. Um, and probably a great deal of, of um, instruction and, and a great deal of encouragement um, if, if they are interested in that. We've got um, another question. What is a reasonable price to pay for a bike tune-up? Um, just in case you didn't want to do this yourself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, once again, sub subjective. I, I wouldn't pay anybody to tune up a bike because I would do it myself. Um, it, it, it depends on what the bike needs. It depends on the, the, the type of bicycle and, and what all it needs. Basically for uh, cleaning and lubricating, I, I would guess around, you know, 50 bucks uh, would be as, as high as, as I would go. But if your bike needs new tires, new inner tubes, um, then, then it could be, it could get a lot more. Um, and and um, sorry, I'm not volunteering to 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 to, to do everybody's bicycle. I, I I don't have time to do that now. I've got too many other things going on. Um, thanks, Robert. We also have a request for um, you to show us an actual removal of a tire and tube and put it back on. Things that you we do with a flat tire in a remote area. Is it possible to do that? Um. Let's see. I hadn't planned on doing that. Robert, could you tilt your camera down a little bit? We're only seeing like half of your wheel. Oh, nice. And yes, perfect. You gotta let some air out of it to get it past the brakes. Now, if you have a, a quick release, um, it's really easy to get that wheel removed. Most modern bikes are going to have a, a quick release like that. Now, um, another thing, if you are in a remote area, um, like that, that person was asking earlier, you're going to have a really hard time finding um, a pinhole in your tire because you're not going to have like a bucket of water to put it in. Um, uh, we're planning a vacation this summer and um, we're going to take a couple of bikes. I made sure to have a, an extra inner tube for um, each of the bicycles just in case we do get a flat. Um, Now, th this is the, these are the tools that I bought um, from Bushwhacker. There's a set of these 
same kind of tools in the, the library kit that I checked out. But basically, you just need to hook the bead on the tire. And then this little hook on the tool is for grabbing a spoke. Now, if you were trying to patch this, you'd want to put air in it and then just, you know, running along, try to listen for any leaks in it. And then use your patch kit. Um, it's got a little piece of uh, sandpaper or a tool for roughing it up. Glue on that, glue on the patch. Um, and it's a contact cement. You let both sides dry, then put it on. Um, fill it up with air again. Make sure that you've got the leak. If you've gotten a flat, you're going to want to go around your whole tire and make sure that there's not a little piece of metal, a nail, whatever, sticking through your tire that has caused that. Because otherwise you're you're going to patch the one hole, put the thing back together, and create another hole. So then, when you're putting this on, there are two beads. They're little pieces of metal um, or fiber, um, but a lot of times metal um, on the inside here. And there's two of them here and here. You want to get one side completely on the wheel. The first side's normally pretty easy to get. Okay. Find your valve stem. Find the hole for the valve stem. Get that tucked up in. If you've got a brand new tube, you're going to want to inflate it and have a little bit of air in it just to help keep it from twisting up inside the tire. Make sure that the valve stem comes through nice and straight. You don't want it to be at an angle or pushed way in there or anything. Gently tuck the tube way up in there. Just curious, Robert, why wouldn't you put the tube on first and then put the tire around it? Are you afraid it's greater likelihood of pinching it? Um, I suppose you could put the tube in the tire, but um, I've never done it like that. I've always done it like this. Okay, I was just curious. I think um, you might, you know, there might be too much material, you know, um, basically what you're talking about is that and i you know I, I suppose there's nothing you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing it that way i've just always put the tire on first a lot of times i've worked i've worked on old um fat tire cruiser bikes those are like kind of my favorite kind of bicycle those really old twins with the gas tanks and stuff and 
those take great big inner tubes and great big tires and you know, fight with those a lot. Um, this one's actually pretty easy. So I'll try it the way Melissa was saying, which is put the tube in the tire. Well, I was thinking about putting the tube on the rim and then no. putting the outside on. No, you, you, that wouldn't work. Okay, that's what I was wondering. That's what I would do. <laughs> yeah, so, if, if you put the tube know. on the rim, you, you would push the tube off the other side as soon okay. as you tried putting the, the tire on. But um, th this is, you know, I, and I, I believe I've seen people do it this way as well. Putting the tube in the tire, lining up your valve stem. Then getting the one side all the way on. Then I'll just go around and start getting this side over the rim. Now I'm going to need these guys again. May only need one to get this back on. Yeah. Snap back on, no problem. My old bicycle pump that I was telling you guys about. It was funny when I bought this bicycle pump, I went into the bike store near where I lived and just bought a cheap bicycle pump because I was like, I just need it for filling up bicycles. I tried using it one time and it broke. <laughs> so I went back to the bike shop and said, Okay, I tried your cheapest pump. Now give me the best pump you've got. And been using this one for a couple of decades now. And I just remembered a mistake I made. I should have put the um, wheel back on the bike before I put air in the tire. But I basically, um, you know, that's it. Um, the tire is pretty wide. So if it's filled with air, it can be hard to get it past the brakes. So I may have to let a bunch of air out of this tire. Yep. Now I'll finish putting the, filling the, the air up to it, its recommended pressure. We go.
Don't forget to put the valve cap back on. All right, any further questions? I didn't see any in the chat, so wish, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you for Peoria Public Library for joining us with this program. And today is Earth Day, so happy Earth Day to everybody. Happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, now, like with this old bike, don't feel like you have to go out and buy something new or anything expensive very cheap to do something like this and get out there and enjoy bike riding. You don't have to put a lot of money into a bicycle to get things going. Yeah, you did a great job with that one, Robert. I think that was actually here probably at least two or three years before it got brought in for a few years and then <laughs> you took it over. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's much more loved now and it's uh, great that we're putting it to use so that you could refurbish it for us. <laughs> Um, yeah, if anybody's interested in this green bike, um, I, I will definitely sell it to them and give the money to, to um, Dunlap to, um, for uh, paying for presentations such as this. Well, thank you. And a lot of people are saying thank you in the chat. So you, You're all very welcome. Now, um, if you guys, if you get your bike um, and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do whatever. Um, feel free to um, email a question, but always remember to go to your local library. Um, so many people don't think of asking things of your local library. Um, I'll give you a very odd thing that I needed to do that I found out by going to the reference desk at the, the library in Arlington Heights, which is a suburb of Chicago. I needed to remove the dashboard from a 1962 Thunderbird. Most people wouldn't go up to the reference desk and tell the reference librarian, I need to remove a dashboard from a 1962 Thunderbird. But I, that's the, the, the way I've learned so many things in my life. I, whether it was school or something I wanted to know on my own, go up to the reference desk. Well, I told that reference librarian that I needed to remove a dashboard from a 1962 Thunderbird. And she, this was in the age before um, the computers, she looked through one book, found out who had a large collection of service manuals, and did an interlibrary loan to get me an original service manual um, that they would send to a Ford dealership for 1962 Thunderbirds, which had all the instructions on how to remove that dashboard. Um, and pretty much anything you need to learn whether it's a bicycle, whether it's about English literature, whether it's about resumes, go to your library. They can help you with anything you need to learn. Oh, thank you, Robert, for that PSA. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one final question. Uh, it says, if your tire gives you a tire pressure range, should you go high, low, or in the middle? Oh, um, could somebody ask me a question that's not subjective? Um, okay, if um, never, whatever the high range is, absolutely never go over that. Um, a lot of times with a pressure range, you're probably talking about a mountain bike or something that's capable of, of being ridden off road. Um, when you're off-road, you're going to be in dirt, mud, whatever, you want to go with the lower pressure. If you're going to be on pavement, you want to go with the higher pressure. If you're going to be some of both, maybe you're going to be on dirt trails, but they're hard pack, you want to be in the middle. Um, with off-road vehicles, whether it's uh, motorcycles or the, the, the great big silly trucks, when those are off-road, the, the guys drop the pressure way down in the tires. Um, I, I do trail riding on, on dirt bikes. And when you're out there, um, it, it depends on the trail. If you're on a really rocky trail, you may want a medium range pressure. If you're in a lot of mud, you, you might want to lower your pressure a little bit because it spreads the tire out and you get better traction. 
But if you're on hard surfaces, you you want, um, especially on a, a road bike, um, if you're on pavement, you want a high pressure because that's going to give you less resistance. You're, it's going to be easier to pedal. Um, if you have low pressure on road, it makes it harder to pedal. And um, so it depends on the circumstances under which you're riding your bike. Road bike, go on the high end. Um, mud, go on the low end. Combination trails, you're going to want to be in the middle. Thanks, Robert. Very good for a multiple choice question. You, you covered the whole range. And you could kind of plan that for with regular tires um, for your car, too, that not that you'd be going off roading necessarily in mud, but you know, when it starts getting warmer, you don't want to have it at the high end. And if it's getting colder, you don't necessarily want to have it at the low end. We have right. Well, question. and um, with, with cars, the temperature, because when air gets warm, it expands. Mm -hmm. That's what, a lot of times. Um, uh, You'll see like the low pressure light um, come on in the winter time. Cold air shrinks, hot air expands. Um, so the, the the actual pressure will drop in cold weather. Yeah, I'm thinking too that sometimes you may have your bike like on a fall day, you know, and it's used to summer and you take it out and it's fine. And then you decide you're going to go water, riding on a 50 degree day and your tire pressure is lower or your tires up a little flatter. It would be that same thing. It, it could, but you, you, you have to remember, it's one of the reasons you can explode um, your bike tire using an air compressor is because it's such a small volume uh -huh. of air. Um, so, you know, even the, the temperature difference with bicycles, because it is such a small volume, is going to be much slighter than on a car where it is such a tremendous volume of air. We have another question. Did you say you use a spray to lubricate chain rather than a liquid oil? And if so, tips for not getting spray all over the bike. <laughs> and how often would you lubricate? Um, oh shoot, I forgot. To, I, um, I actually forgot to bring my chain and cable loop in with me. Um, no, there, I, um, uh, I use chain, uh, Li um, liquid wrench chain and cable loop is what I've, I've, I've um, been using. And yes, it's a spray. And quite simply, pretend that this is chain and cable loop. Put a rag behind it and hold it really close and spray it. Then Move it a little bit and spray it. Um, what, what I always do, um, I intentionally put too much lubricant on the chain. And then I do this on my motorcycles too. And then um, put some paper towels under it and let some of it drip off. And then I just take those paper towels and I wipe off the excess. I'd rather have too much lubricant on the chain than not enough. Um, but you don't want to go crazy and just leave all of that extra lubricant on there because it's going it, to, you know, it, it is going to get all over your pants leg or whatever. Um, but yeah, when you're spraying that uh, chain and cable loop, just a rag behind the chain, um, if you're doing the cables, it's got a little tube. You know, the, these things. Basically, you know, here, here's the bare cable, and here's where it's in the jacket. Just squirting a little bit down in, into that jacket, and not a lot. You, you don't need to put a ton of it. Um, a, just a little squirt. Um, how often when you, you bring it out, um, anytime it gets wet, if you're out riding and it starts raining, um, when, when you get the bike home, make sure it's dried off and clean, um, and th then spray a little bit more lubricant on it. Um, and then of course, when you're putting the bike away, it's pretty much the opposite of the presentation I, I showed here. Go over everything clean everything up um, and then lubricate it, then put the bike away. 
it, it's important to do that when you're putting the bike away as well as when you're taking it out. Uh, especially lubrication. Uh, when you have a chain that's lubricated, it won't rust. If you have a chain that's dry, absolutely dry, moisture in the air will make it rust. So eh, beginning of the season, middle of the season, end of the season, anytime it gets wet. Perfect, Robert. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.